Well, good morning. We're going to be in the letter of 1 Peter today. So if you want to be finding 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, you can be looking for that. This morning, I want to ask you a question. And this is one of the most difficult questions that you can be asked. What are we? What are we? Now, when I ask you that, I want you to think about it from the relationship point of view. What are we? Okay, I'll go back. <laughs> How many times in a relationship have you been with another man or another woman or and you've went out on dates and, and you've saw each other and you know you've gave each other your life story. Maybe you met them on TikTok or, or whatever. <laughs> Don't laugh. I'm trying to be cool and hip when I say that. <laughs> when do you always know that the relationship that something might not be right? When you have to look at that person and go what are we? We've heard all of the alleged problems with today's society. We have too many choices. We have too much freedom. We have too much internet. And to go along with all of this freedom, we don't have any responsibility. This generation's focus seems to be on building a career it seems to be on building material things. And we seem to be so engrossed in our screens, in our phones, that building a relationship seems unattainable. It seems all about me and not about the other one. Are we doomed to forever live in a society to where a relationship is a gray area. Well, I know other people are in them, but me, I, I don't know. Having a significant other is not a myth, but it is rapidly becoming that way. And you heard me correctly when I said that. One of the most dangerous things that you can do is look at a person that you're going out with and go, well, what are we? Are we friends? Are we boyfriend, girlfriend, or what are we? The reason that I ask you this question this morning, the reason I bring this up, is because we live in a society that has a problem with relationships. If we can't have a relationship with each other, where does that leave us when it comes to Jesus Christ? 1 Peter chapter 2. But you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we come to you this morning. I pray that our hearts are open, that our minds are are open, that we are focused to hear your word, that we have gathered together to worship you, that we have gathered together to be taught. Lord, I pray for this world. I pray for this society, Lord, that with all of the things that we have to deal with, just the fundamental things 
that are wrong with our society. Lord, I pray for grace. I pray for strength. Most of all, I pray for wisdom, Lord. Bring me what I need to give this message the way that you intended for it to be given. And Lord, I ask this in your name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have not realized it, we live in a midst of a society that stumbles over the name Jesus Christ. We live in a society that flight... Look, well, I can't even think of the word now. We live in a society that disobeys the message that Jesus Christ brought. Not only does this society disobey it, it flaunts it. And then this society persecutes anyone who shows that they have a relationship with Christ. So in the midst of a society like this, how easy is it for a new believer or a non-believer to want to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ? When they live in a society that is becoming programmed that relationships aren't necessary. You don't need to be married to have sex. You don't need to have a covenant relationship with God. It's, we're friends with benefits. We're this or we're that. We don't need to do that. That's old school. This is the way it is now. What would you say if someone come to you and said, I want to have a relationship with Jesus? But how do I do it? What would God say to you this morning if you ask him, what are we? I think three things that he would share with you this morning. The first thing is he would tell you, and this is point number one on your outline if you want to fill it in, you are God's choice. God chose you to be part of his family. God chose you to be a son or daughter of him. To be an integral part of his time. To be a recipient of the everlasting love that he gives. But you have to make a choice. Do you accept it? Or do you live in that gray area Says, ah, I don't know, God, what are we? I fully understand that sometimes the thoughts of the growing pains in a relationship doesn't just excite us. Oh, yeah, let's go do this. So Peter gives us these words. And he says here in the scripture, he lays out the incredible spiritual riches that you can and you will receive by pursuing this relationship. He tells us and he encourages you in the scripture, he reminds you of the value that God puts on you as a son or daughter. This word is important, value. When we go to H-E-B, we look for value, do we not? If we go to Walmart, we look for value. Value is important. And God puts value on you right where you're sitting. You mean something to Him. You are important to Him. We all like to feel like we're worth something, do we not? It's not much of a relationship if you don't feel like you're worth anything. If you feel like your significant other doesn't care anything about you, the relationship just doesn't seem to work. But to God, we, each and every one of us, we are everything to Him. He ties us back to the Old Testament heritage in Exodus 19.6. And Peter is quoting this. He says, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. 
He says, you shall be a nation of priests and you will be holy to me. You have value. You are important to me. And then he reminds us in contrast, if you are part of the disobedient group, a part of the group that doesn't want a relationship, part of the group that says, I, 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 God, we can just be friends with benefits. You know, you, you can bless my life and, and I'm just going to do what I want to do because you love me that much, right? What are we? What are we? We are chosen. We are part of an elected, we are an elite group. Peter again echoes Isaiah 43.20. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. I will be with you in the middle of the COVID crisis. I will be with you no matter what. I will bring you water. I will bring you strength. But we all know that no relationship is easy. There's always going to be bumps and potholes in the road. There's going to be deserts. But he will bring you water in the desert. God has made his choice. He chose you. But will you choose him back? Will you say, I want a relationship with you. You are my father. You see, a relationship with God isn't like a relationship on Tinder or TikTok or any of them other things. You see, society wants you to believe that there is a gray area. With God, there is no gray. It is black and white. You either are in a relationship with him or you are not in a relationship with him. If we live like unbelievers, if we act like unbelievers, if we choose him not, Galatians 6 tells us, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For what you sow, you will reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap. If you live your life with no relationship, then you will reap a reward of no relationship. You have to make a choice. The choice that you have to make is not what most think that it is. You see, there is no, well, let me think about it. Or my personal favorite. Well, let me pray about it. There's no well, 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 let's wait till the COVID's over and then we'll see what happens. Or let's wait till football season's over. That, that's getting started. My Sundays are fixed to see busy. There's no, let's see how it goes. Let's just go out and enjoy each other's company and see what happens. You will. Make a choice. And the choice you make, do you choose life or do you choose death? Do you choose to live in heaven where everything is wonderful, where there's horses that don't buck and cows you can work and don't cuss? Grass chest high to an elk? Clean water everywhere you look? Or do you choose the fires of hell? Because if you don't make the right choice, that's what you're going to get. You see, with God, there is no gray area. You are a choice of God. Now, will you accept it? The second thing that God would say to you, if you ask him, what are we? He will say, you are my possession. 
Point number two, you are God's possession. When God tells you that you are my possession, it's not the same connotation that pops into your mind. I can read it from here. I can feel the heat coming off. I ain't nobody's possession. I'm a man. I'm a woman. That's what the world wants you to think. That's the world, the way the world wants you to react. But see, the next phrase that Peter says, that you are a people for his own possession, that you are God's own people, it literally in the Greek means a people for his possession. Because you as a Christian, you are a special people. We as Christians are preserved to God. No matter what this nasty old world does, it cannot take that away from you. The words belonging to God literally goes back to Hebrews 10, 39 that says, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Did you ever think about when you asked that question, what are we? That your soul is at stake. Peter just used Old Testament terms to give a New Testament truth. Israel was a chosen people. Israel was a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. And so you today, if you are a true believer and you have given your life to Christ, if you have entered into that relationship, then you too are God's chosen people. You belong to God. The great Chinese theologian Watchman Nee was once quoted as saying, I must first have the sense of God's possession of me before I can have the sense of God's presence with me. I must first have the sense of God's possession of me before I can have the sense of God's presence with me. He wrote that in prison. He spent the last 20 years of his life in a Chinese prison. And just so you understand, he died in 1972. So this isn't some, oh, that's ancient history. Well, I guess 72. I, well, that was the year I was born. Oh. Okay, let's not talk about the age. But this is not prehistoric history. Following the communist revolution, he was persecuted. He had the relationship. He never had to go, hey God, where are we? He knew where he was. And it cost him 20 years of his life in a prison. You have to be able to understand that you belong to God. And that's the way you feel his presence. When you give yourself to him... That's when you feel him in your heart. That's when you will feel him in your life. And that's when the people around you will go, hey, you know what? You look different. You don't act like you used to act. Malachi 3.17 says, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Chosen people. You are a possession. It used to only be Israelites. Now, in the age of grace, in the age of the church, it's anyone who has given their life to Jesus. Anyone who asked for that relationship. But along with that gift, what is it? Superman, Spider-Man, one of those men said... Along with great power comes great responsibility. Along with that gift, you have a job. We are all to be priests. We are all to do as the Israelites were initially instructed to do, to spread the word. At Sinai, God told Moses to tell the people, you will be for me a kingdom of priests. 
Peter called Christians a holy priesthood and a royal priesthood. That's each and every one of us. It is our responsibility to spread the word in the time of COVID, in the time of anything. Revelation 1.6, And he made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The word from which priesthood is derived is never used in the New Testament to describe the ministry. But it is used to describe the task of all Christian believers. Okay, if you're here this morning and you've been coming on Wednesday night, I'm going to test how good my teaching has been. Throughout the Old Testament, kings and priests have always been separate individuals. There's only been two. In class, we talked about them. Mm, okay. I know what it is. It's just the pressure. People's looking at me. There's only been two kings that also were priests. One was Melchizedek, and the other was Jesus Christ. Those are the only two. The only king that tried it, and he didn't work very well, was King Saul. In fact, 1 Samuel 13, he waited seven days to the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me. Bring me the peace offerings. And he offered them. And as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to greet him and Samuel said, what have you done? And the class hopefully will remember what happened to Saul after. See, you have an opportunity to do something that none of them had the chance to do. You today, as a Christian, you today in a relationship with Jesus can be king and priest. A holy nation is a people called to reflect the character of the God who has called them. A people belonging to God who uses the imagery of the eastern kings who kept special chambers, that kept their treasures in those chambers so the tax men couldn't find them. See, each of you have the opportunity to be in God's special room. This idea was first found in Exodus. And then Paul repeats it in Titus 2. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous in good works. You are God's possession. And the third thing that God would tell you if you ask him, what are we? He would say, let me give you my mercy. Point number three is God's mercy. God's mercy has come to us not because we would deserve it, not because we have earned it, but because He loves you. The people who read this in Peter's letter, all of these were Christians that had run from Rome. Nero had destroyed Rome had set it on fire and burn it because he wanted to build Rome bigger. And then he didn't understand. His people didn't want to do it. So when they started to riot, who set this fire? Who has burnt our city? The Christians did it. So a persecution started that is not being seen till the end that will match it. But during that time, all of these Jews, all of these Christians had tried to find mercy on their own. They had run for their lives. They were lost. They were looking at God going, what are we? And Peter wrote them this letter. By coming to faith with Jesus, you find that mercy that you're looking for. You are finding that mercy that you need so desperately. 
God's mercy will come to you in a tangible, real life form. It will come to you in the gifts of forgiveness and eternal life. The New Testament is very consistent in suggesting that these benefits, the benefits of being God's friend, extend to us through his mercy. Hosea 1.10 Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, You are children of God. Praise is a difficult word to translate. Praise is a difficult word to perform sometimes. But to a Christian, when you are in that relationship, when you know what you and God are, then it should come naturally. You should understand that mercy is a reward of that relationship. Hosea tells us again in chapter 2, 23, And I will sow for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he will say, you are my God. The Israelites are getting, have just been taken by the Babylonians. They're fixed to spend 70 years in captivity. But he promises redemption. He calls the nation of Israel no mercy. But he says, you will receive mercy. And he calls the Israelites that he have just said, you are not my people. He says, but I will call you my people. This is how great it is to be the choice that God makes. This is how great it is to be a possession of God. This is how great it is to receive mercy. Isaiah 43, 14, For thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives. Even the Chaldeans in the ships in which they resort. He repeatedly emphasizes, I will forgive you. I will have mercy on you. You are my chosen. And through that, I will receive glory. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout from the depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and he will be glorified in Israel. God not only redeemed Christians out of Babylon, he not only pulled people from the Persians, but the most important thing that he saved you from, he pulled you from the darkness. pulled you from the darkness. He said, come to me. I choose you. And I will take you into the light. 1 John 2.8 And at the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Several years ago, there was an auction, a sports memorabilia auction. And you would probably recognize several of the names. One of Tim Duncan's practice jerseys was there, a pair of Michael Jordan's game-worn shoes, Troy Aikman's cleats, Michael Irvin's little black book, all this stuff. But see, each of these things, just as things, held no value. It's just an old sweaty, stinky shirt. It's just a couple pairs of old dirty shoes. These things got value because of who owned them. These things got value because of whose possessions they were. These things by themselves were worthless. But because of who they belonged to, they brought piles of money. 
See, that's the way God's relationship with you will make you. Your value comes from who owns you. Your value comes from who has chosen you. And your value comes from who has mercy on you. Peter's repeated emphasis on the term people, he used the word race and nation and people twice, is that in a believer, as a believer, Pastor Chris is just an ordinary, bald-headed, fat dude that talks funny. But because Jesus Christ touched my heart, because Jesus Christ gave me an opportunity to receive mercy and to make something better of myself, now I have value. I am a son of God. One of the most common responses from people when you talk about having that relationship is I'm not worthy of it. I'm not worth anything. This world conditions you to think that you are worth nothing. But you have a father that when you ask him what are we to you he will say, you are everything to me. You are everything to me. God is telling you these three things this morning. You are my choice. You are my possession. And if you accept this, then I will give you mercy. I will make you worthy. God has made his choice. Now it's your move. But you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. A people from my possession. What choice would you make? Would you pray with me this morning? Lord God, we open our hearts today. I pray from the very bottom of my heart that everyone in this building today has made that choice. That they have looked to you and said, Lord, I cannot live without you. Lord, I don't want any what are we questions. I don't want to come on that day of judgment when I stand before you well, Jesus, I, I don't know what are we. What are we? I want every person in this room. I want every person in Wilson County. I pray that every person on this planet can look at you and say, You are my Father. And I love you. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning, if they have any doubt that what the answer to that question is, that today is the day that question gets answered. Before they walk out these doors, they say, Lord, all I want is for us to have this black and white relationship. I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter. I don't care what this world thinks. I don't care what this world says. God, you have chosen me, and today I choose you back. Lord, we just continue to pray for your mercy to continue to come across this country. Lord, we continue to pray for those in Afghanistan, we pray for our brothers and sisters that are fighting for their lives over there today, not because of their race, not because of who they are or where they are, but just because they said, I have a relationship with you, Jesus Christ. And if that means I die, then I die today. Lord, I pray for the Christians here that we would have that resolve, that we wouldn't run and hide, 
that any little thing that comes along, we run and we hide. That we have that relationship that says, I want to be with you and that's what I'm going to do. Lord, we just love you and we thank you. Amen. Stand up and let's